Yeah, all right, started. Okay, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Amal Hussein. So this is the final talk uh, in the track on dynamical, so uh, dynamics of games that we've been doing for the past couple of months now. Uh, so this is going to be the last one before we break for the summer and then return, as Boumediene was saying, hopefully in October. So since it is you know, a parting gift slightly. I wanted to start with a quick recap of everything that we've done so far uh, before we actually move on to the subject of uh, the talk, which is mean field games. So quickly recap. Um, if you remember from our first talk, the whole notion that we were trying to study was about the interaction, the adaptation of multiple agents, right? And we wanted a way to understand this. So there's two parts to that. There's the interaction part and there's the adaptation part. And so for the interaction bit, we were using the language of game theory to understand how agents actually um, interact with one another. But specifically what we're interested in is how agents evolve on these games. So we require them to play this, these games multiple times and we require them to adapt and change their behaviors. And that led to this fundamentally non-stationary problem where agents actually have to change their behavior based on those of the others. And so to deal with this non-stationarity, we were using the language of dynamical systems, which is where learning dynamics came in, right? We introduced a couple of different learning dynamics, the replicator, fictitious play and reinforcement learning. And it's been our task so far to study the sort of behaviors that these give rise to. And we, we know at this point that they can all give rise to, yes, convergence to an equilibrium, even the Nash equilibrium, but also some much more interesting and rich variety of behaviors, including periodic behavior that you just saw and chaotic behaviors, even in the case of a two player game, right? Now it's this latter point of chaotic dynamics, which kind of motivated where we went next because we looked at this study, I think uh, this was the second talk where we were looking at reinforcement learning and specifically this result that as you increase the number of players in the game, you get the, the prevalence of chaotic dynamics as the authors put it, uh, becomes much stronger, right? So you're more likely to be uh, towards the onset of chaotic dynamics as you increase the number of players in the game. Now, that's obviously a really interesting result, but from an analysis and a design perspective, it's kind of annoying because we'd like to design our systems to have outcomes that we can predict, right? And outcomes that we can control specifically. And this chaotic dynamic result poses a bit of a problem when it comes to, to designing our systems. And so what we were looking for are ways to reduce down this, uh, this population system towards something that we can actually analyze, right? I mentioned last time that there were two ways that we're looking at it, and we've already looked at the first, the network game format, right? The network game format was this notion that on this, population, we're going to impose some kind of a social network so that each agent doesn't just interact with everyone, as is typically assumed um, in the context of, of game theory, but rather the agent only has these pairwise interactions with each one of its neighbors, right? And that reduces this population problem down to just a series of two player games. That made our analysis a little bit easier, but it didn't get rid of any of the, the variety of dynamics that we saw, right? So in the, the last talk, we were looking at a specific type of these networks, the three player network, right? So if we just focus our attention on these players specifically, we looked at the sort of dynamics you could expect and all of them, all of our um, dynamics, the replicator, fictitious play and reinforcement learning, did things that were in a word interesting, right? So we saw that replicator leads to um, periodic behavior on, on certain classes of three player games. Same thing with fictitious play. We saw these periodic orbits that emerge and we went even further with reinforcement learning 
to show that there's perhaps some kind of bifurcation that occurs where you move from convergent behavior to periodic, right? Or vice versa, depending on which way you go. But the point is that all of them are leading to quite interesting behaviors. And we needed a way of understanding that. Now, in the last talk, everything that we looked at was experimental, right? Because when we're dealing with population studies, when we, we've moved from beyond two player games, we're entering like some kind of uncharted waters here, right? Because the analysis for these have not yet been developed. And these are areas of open questions that hopefully um, some of you might, might go on to, to tackle. And what we're gonna be looking at today is no different, right? We're still gonna be looking at open questions because what we're looking at here is, again, very, very recent work. Specifically, uh, today is all about the second population model called the mean field game, right? So if the network game was all about, you know, taking a finite population and imposing a structure on it, the mean field game kind of goes in the opposite direction. It says, okay, let's just take our, we, we have a population of agents. Instead of trying to constrain them, let's just take it all the way out to infinity, right? So that instead of thinking about 10,000 agents or 100,000 agents, or a million agents, we just go, okay, well, now we're gonna say that the number of agents in our system is infinite. And what we'll see is rather than complicating matters that actually reduces the problem significantly and helps with our analysis. Okay. So- Sorry, sorry just there is a presentation thing. There's the, this uh, vertical bar on the left that is always showing up. So it's, uh, okay, yeah. Did that go, did that go away? Yeah, yes, yes, now it's better, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, can do it this way. Cool. Okay, so to motivate what the mean field game is, uh, I want to use a particular example. It's called the bar problem, um, proposed, I think, by the Santa Fe Institute. Um, but basically, it, it goes as follows, all right? So we have a town, and there's two available bars in this, this town, right? Let's just call them A and B. Okay, and let's say there's about a hundred people in this town, right? So they're, they're all individual agents. I'm not gonna draw a hundred of them, but um, the, let's say there's a hundred of them and they need to make a decision of which bar they're going to go to on a particular night. Now, what's specific about this case is that each agent wants to go to a bar that's not too crowded. Right? This could be just because they don't like crowded bars. This could be a social distancing type situation. But the point is they would prefer not to go to a crowded bar. And so now what you have is a situation where my decision of which bar to go to is dependent on the entire population, all of the other 99 agents in the system. So how do we make a judgment on what the outcome of this game is going to be, right? There's three different formats of looking at this. First is the traditional game theoretic way, right? In the traditional game theoretic way, we had everyone interacting with everyone, you know, trying to make a decision simultaneously. And conceptually, what that might look like is, uh, I guess we, we all hop onto a hundred person Zoom call or something like that. And we all try and make a decision over who's gonna to go to which bar so that neither of them get too crowded. Now, obviously you can imagine that when you have a hundred people trying to make a decision simultaneously, in a colloquial sense, you can see why that might lead to a chaotic system. Right? Anyone who's had to try and decide what restaurant to go to with a group of six friends knows how difficult it can be, let alone a hundred, right? So it's not too surprising that you would yield some chaotic dynamics when you're trying to make a decision with that many players interacting with each other. The second format of looking at it that we've looked at so far is the network game, right? In the network game, Instead of me interacting with everyone, 
over some kind of simultaneous Zoom call, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to call up each one of my friends and I'm going to say, hey, which bar are you going to? And I'm going to make my decision based off that. And that's a little bit more realistic, right? And it's also a little bit more tractable because we don't have to monitor, you know, 99 interactions for each agent. We only need to monitor how many, based on how many friends they have or how many friends they call. But there's a critical difference in this particular scenario. The critical difference is my decision on which bar I want to go to doesn't just depend on my friends. It depends on the entire population, right? Because the whole point of the model is I don't want to go to a bar that's too crowded. I don't care who's in the bar. I just don't want to go to a bar that's too crowded, okay? So the last way that we want to look at it is the mean field format. In the mean field format, this is the way that it works. Everyone just goes to a bar, right? And I might show up to, let's say, to bar A, and it turns out there's, let's say, 70 people there. So there's a, it's a quite a crowded bar at this point. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, okay, I'm going to go to bar B. Or maybe I go to bar B, I see that that's really packed and I go to bar A instead. The point is that my decision on what I'm gonna do is dependent not on who's at the bar or any individual action, but rather the aggregate behavior of the entire population, okay? But what that requires is that, that first point of, I don't care about the individual. Any given individual being there doesn't affect, doesn't strongly affect my decision to go to the bar as well. And similarly, my decision to go to a particular bar doesn't affect or doesn't significantly affect anybody else's decision to go to any given place, right? So in that sense, what you have is what's called a, a weekly interacting system, right? A weekly interacting system of particles. Because what that means is each individual does has a negligible effect on the entire population. And so we don't need to think about individual interactions, we only need to think about the population as a whole. Okay? I hope that makes sense so far. Are there any questions based on what I've just said? You can take that as a no. Okay. So now that we've given a bit of an intuitive picture of what's going on, I want to try and formalize it a little bit so that we have something that we can analyze and we can actually think about. The way that we're gonna um, formalize it is as follows. So we have a system of N agents, right? And to each one of these N agents, we assign its dynamics as a stochastic, it's a stochastic dynamics, right? So the way that this is gonna work is that we have some kind of uh, dynamic process F, right? Which is dependent on the behavior of not only my own, my own choice, so my own state X, but also on the state of other agents, right? And finally, we've got this U, which is, um, you can think of it as a control function, which is how I'm gonna be thinking of it, but it's also, you know, uh, a generalization of, the word action, right? So in sum, we have a function that depends on my state, my, my own action, and the behavior of another agent. And what I want to do is I want to average that over all of the agents. Does that make sense? So we're taking the state of every single agent in the population, we're just averaging the effect over all of them. And then we have this um, a drift term that incorporates the stochasticity. Similarly, we have a, um, a cost function. Remember in game theory, we need a few things. We need the agents themselves, which is what we have. We need the actions that they take, which is given by the control or the action, whatever you want to call it. And we need to know why they're taking those actions. And that's given by a cost function, right? But in this case, in the mean field case, 
my cost function is going to be dependent on, this should actually be a capsule N, but it's going to be dependent on an average effect over all of the other agents, okay? So I have an, a loss function that depends on the state of any given agent and I average over the entire population, all right? So that's my entire setting for the mean field game, just the dynamics of the individual and their cost function. But the issue here is, in order for this to work, I now have to take an average over all n agents, which can be kind of cumbersome because I have to, you know, deal with each uh, each interaction individually and then take an average over the lot. I'd rather not do that. Um, and so, I'm going to write it in a slightly different way first. What I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce what's called uh, an empirical measure. over the entire population, right? So you can think of it as, okay, let's say there's five agents and they take that state on, on the line, right? And so you just have uh, X1, X2, X3, X4 and X5, right? And so these essentially form an empirical measure over the entire population that tell me what the state of each given agent is, okay? And so that way I've just replaced the sum with um, the sum over all agents with this empirical measure in the, uh, in, the in the stochastic dynamics, all right? And I've done the same thing in the cost function, okay? But again, there's this problem of I need to deal with N agents. I don't want to have to, if, especially if there's, you know, 10,000 agents in the environment, I don't want to have to go through every single one of them and monitor their position and then have to think about, you know, uh, averaging over the entire effect. So instead, what I'm going to do, and this is the whole thesis of um, the mean field game, is I'm going to take the limit as n goes to infinity. Right, And what I'm going to hope or what I'm going to assume is that my empirical measure is going to converge to, in, in the limit as n goes to infinity, is going to converge to some fixed distribution, right? Some fixed um, probability measure mu. And what that is, if we, if we look at the picture on the left, I think that displays it quite well, which is basically like in, in the empirical measure system, you would take the, um, yeah, you would you would take the position of each individual into account, right? And then you would average over the entire effect. What the mean field format requires that you do is you just instead of thinking about the entire population, the individual, you look over um, a macro state over the entire population. And that way you can just form a continuous distribution and think about that instead of having to think about each individual, right? Now, we're assuming that this would converge and there are results which ensure that these um, empirical measures do converge to something fixed. And what that means is we don't even need to think about N agents anymore. We can just deal with, uh, we can just deal with mu now, right? So in each one of the, uh, in the dynamics, that we saw earlier, instead of looking at the empirical measure, now I use this approximate measure instead, right? This approximation being at the n equals infinity or n tending to infinity limit, right? And I do the same thing in the loss function. I don't have to average my loss over all of my uh, opponents. I just look at the um, approximate distribution, okay? And so what you're, you end up with is this uh, SDE, which is mostly referred to as McLean Vlasov SDE, right? And a control function. Sorry, uh, not a control function. I just gave, gave away the whole plot. A uh, cost function. Now, once we have these two things defined, 
we have one task and one task only, which is each agent is just going to minimize this cost function, right? And what they're looking for in particular is to find a value of uh, the cost function, which is minimized for themselves. And the idea of um, the mean field game is once that decentralized strategy has been accepted, where each agent has minimized their um, strategies or, or their cost function, sorry, then we can take that strategy and go back to the end player case, the finite player case. And what, we're, what we result with is an, an approximation of the Nash equilibrium. Okay, so just to like quickly recap what I've just said, we take the dynamics for the end player case, we take it to infinity, right? And we solve the game in the infinite player limit, right? By requiring each agent to minimize their cost function or maximize the utility function, depending on uh, the problem scenario. But once we have that done in the infinite player case, we can then go back down to the end player case and we've arrived at an approximation of the Nash equilibrium. Now, it is an approximation. You're not actually going to get to uh, the Nash equilibrium of the end player case necessarily, like in, entirely, but you're close enough. And that's a good thing because when you have, I mean, calculating the Nash equilibrium for five players is quite a difficult task, right? Calculating it for 100,000 players is significantly more difficult. And so what this allows you to do is just get close enough to the, uh, to the Nash equilibrium of the finite player game. And what's useful is that this epsilon, so the epsilon measuring the discrepancy between the Nash equilibrium and its approximation, this will actually um, converge down to zero as you increase the number of players. So the mean field limit as you might expect, is a better approximation for 100,000 players than it is for 10,000 players, right? And it's obviously even better as, as you keep increasing the number of players in the game. So far, so good. Are there any questions based on just the formalism itself? Yeah. Yeah. Um, when you say you do the same for the cost function, it sounds very suggestive, like, okay, to do that, but can you, you give me the rationale to do the same, or am I allowed to consider some alternatives to do something so, different for the cost function? In different in what sense? Well, doing the same is, I appreciate the trick here mm. as, as, a, as a simple way, okay, to get out of the difficulty. But uh, what if it's not so right to do that? Um, <laughs> I'm kind of quizzing so with this. So, yeah, so that is actually, a, a, it's actually a really good point because you do need to ensure that the parameters of your problem are sufficient so that you can actually do this. Um, sorry. Okay. Um, so you need to make sure that the parameters of, of what you're doing are sufficient so you can actually make this approximation. And there are uh, conditions such as like the monotonicity of um, your, your F function, which allow you to make this sort of approximation. Now, does this work generally? No, you're, you're right. So there will be situations in which you can't make this, uh, you can't make this approximation. But when your functions are sufficiently well behaved, it, as you said, does make a nice trick for you to be able to follow. Does that make sense? Yes. It's okay. Actually, on that note, the going in the other direction is a little bit more problematic um, because so we've made the assumption that, you know, as we go to infinity, we get this um, 
empirical measure that converges to some fixed measure that we can live with. But going the other way is a slight bit of a concern because once you'd solve the game at the infinite player limit and then go back down, you're assuming that you know the limit of all of your Nash equilibria for the finite player game will eventually converge to this equilibrium at the infinite player limit. And we can't always make that assumption. Um, now, again, conditions for when you can and when you can't make that assumption is very much still open for um, discovery. So there is, there is a little bit of um, a grain of salt that you have to take this with. Any other questions? No, okay. Um, where were we? So, okay, so we're solving the problem at the infinite player limit and then hope, hopefully going back down to the end player case and hopefully this results in a Nash equilibrium for the end player case, right? So our question is, what? how do we solve the game in the infinite player limit, right? Because that's essentially the linchpin of this entire problem. What you might notice is that once you get to this stage, right, where you've taken this measure across the entire population, and this measure is now fixed, right? So it doesn't depend on, so the empirical measure depended on the behaviors of, or the state of all the other agents. This approximation doesn't depend on it at all. It doesn't depend on the number of agents. It doesn't depend on where they are. And so the notion of the mean field game is now the behavior of each agent is decoupled from each other, right? And so you're no longer even left with a game. You're just left with an optimal control problem, right? What you're trying to do is minimize or optimize your cost function with respect to the SDE that we've given. So this is technically a stochastic optimal control problem. And how do we solve an optimal control problem? Well, we can write down an HJB equation. An HJB equation, oh, or Hamilton, Hamilton, Jacobi, Bellman. I always get those confused. Um, equation is essentially just a generalization of dynamic programming, which allows you to find the solution to uh, an optimal control problem like the one that we've just talked about. And specifically for our scenario, um, the equations themselves look kind of disgusting, but uh, they don't matter too much. What matters is once you solve this, right, this just gives you a tool with which you can solve the, the control problem. And what you end up with is some kind of control that is a function only of the um, the approximate measure that we, we've been using, right? The, in the infinite limit. And so you can plug that, that back into the dynamics and you're left with this closed loop system, right? Where your dynamics are being influenced by this control function that itself depends on the uh, empirical measure across the entire population, okay? And there's this final point that I do need to mention because we have what two equations so far and we have three unknowns. So in order to make everything consistent, we need one more thing. Um, and specifically what we need is for X and mu to be what's called consistent. And the idea of consistency is essentially that um, how do we put this? So the probability of X being less than any value alpha is just given by the, sorry, this should be minus infinity to alpha, right? So basically the idea is just that the, the state or, the, or the, me, the probability measure is an actual representation of the entire state of the system. So you can't just pick any measure that you want and hope that everything works out, it does actually need to be consistent with the entire state of the population. But that was an assumption that we made to begin with. And as long as that is maintained, we're fine. Okay. But now that means we have an entire closed loop system that we can solve. And 
once we get the solution, so once we get the optimal solution for um, the control function, what that means is we've minimized our cost, right? We've minimized this J function from before. Now, once you've actually, before I move on, there's something that should be noted. The optimal control that we've just uh, determined for, uh, from the HJB equation, this was chosen to minimize the cost function entirely, right? And so you can think of that in much the same way as we looked at before as what's called a best response function, right? So if you recall from the talk that we did on fictitious play, the idea is that at each stage, an agent is going to look at the rest of the opponents and play a best response. So play the control or play the action which maximizes their utility, right? In the exact same way here, the agents are going to look at the distribution or, uh, yes, yeah, so the distribution over the entire population and play the action which minimizes their cost function. So this is, you know, the optimal control in this context is the same as the best response as you would traditionally think of it in game theory. And that will be useful in a minute when we start to think about, oh, no, it will be useful immediately when we start to think about what fictitious play is on mean field games, okay? Before we move on to fictitious play in mean field games, any questions on the whole choosing the optimal control from what we've just done? I have a question. Yes. Uh, the kind of control you are introducing right now mm -hmm. is sort of internal control. Can you yes. also have external control on the system? That's actually a really good point. So you're absolutely right. So this is internal. So internal in the sense that this is all completely decentralized. So each agent is choosing its own action, right? Um, it's not being imposed upon by anyone else. Now, as to whether you can do an external control. So there actually, actually, yes, there has been much more recent work in which you have what are called um, major and minor players in the mean field game. So this would be things like, I think the example that it was based on is if you have you know, major banks who don't look at you know, individual uh, branches, but rather look at the aggregate effect, they have a stronger influence on the behavior on, of, the smaller bank, of the smaller banks or the smaller branches than vice versa, right? So in that sense, you have a little bit more of a hierarchy or a bit more of an external imposition of the smaller banks from the larger ones. Um, and this kind of generalizes to a notion of leader follower type systems in which you, know, you have like an influencer who has a much stronger effect on their followers than the followers have on, or than any individual follower has on the influencer. So in that sense, you do have a, a notion of external control. However, what you don't have is a completely separate being. So in the bank example, you, we generally don't consider in the mean field game, like the government imposing regulations on the bank, right? Like a completely uh, external system. The reason why is because you'd like to make these as decentralized as possible. Um, because if you're thinking about things like design or analysis of, of crowds, that kind of thing, each decision is made on an individual level rather than you know, an external being uh, imposing its, its will on, on, on the system. Does that make sense? So my answer to your question is you can have uh, variations. So you can have um, impositions of people within the, the mean field population itself, but what you don't have is an external being completely outside of the population influencing the, the system. Okay, thanks. Okay, uh, and my screen just turned off. Um, okay, 
So we've looked at mean field games from a um, almost like an online perspective. Actually, no, this would be more of an offline perspective because this HAB equation is, as is generally done in optimal control, is solved offline and then implemented uh, as a strategy, right? But we were always interested in, in learning on online behavior on adaptation. So a natural question to ask is, okay, how, do, how does one learn on a mean field game, right? And specifically the learning model that we're gonna be looking at because it's, I, want, I don't wanna say exclusively, but almost exclusively the um, only one with the, the strongest analytic results in mean field games. The one that we're gonna be looking at is fictitious play. And the reason why we're looking at fictitious play and why it has the analysis behind it is because it's quite a natural extension of what we've just seen. Sorry, your, your uh, screen is shared. Yes, is it not showing? I just see the names of the people. Oh, okay, let me try again. Sorry. No, thank you for telling me. Can you see it now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so. Yes, yeah, I still show the, the, yeah, okay, now it's gone. I'm at the vertical bar on the left. All yeah. uh, right. So um, with the, yeah, so what we've looked at so far is with calculating an optimal control, right? Based on the current, uh, the, the current distribution over the population. Now, if you remember from fictitious play, the only adaptation we need to, to make is instead of looking at the current state of the population, we look at a time average of the population, right? So in a two player game, what we had was that each agent keeps track of the behavior of the, its opponent and plays, plays optimally according to the time average of their opponent, right? But in this case, the opponent that each individual sees is the distribution of the population. So what we're gonna do is, um, we're gonna start with some initial distribution. So this is almost like an initial belief of what the, the whole system looks like, right? Of what the other agents are doing. And we're gonna play optimally according to that. And as we evolve and as we um, move forward in time, we're gonna be keeping track of this distribution over time, right? And at each time step, all we're gonna do is play uh, optimally according to the, the time average of our, of our population distribution, all right? So in reality, all that's really changed is instead of looking at this mu of t, you're looking at some kind of mu bar of t, which is just, you know, the average, let's denote it by n, saying at time step n, we're denoting it um, as an average effect over time, right? And that's the only thing that's changed in our entire system. So hopefully the results should transfer um, immediately. And fortunately, it turns out they do, um, again, under suitable conditions. So this goes back to uh, what we were saying earlier of uh, when is this sort of trick allowed? Because it is, it is a trick that we're, we're using here. And we need to know when that trick can actually be used. And so far, there's only been two conditions that have been found under which this is possible. It's possible to apply fictitious play on the mean field game in the exact same way that we've looked at so far, right? The first is, uh, uh, I think I mentioned earlier, when the reward function is monotone, right? And the second is when the reward function or the dynamics uh, can be derived from a potential. So the idea is that your F uh, function can be derived um, as a, uh, as the derivative of a, a distribution. Okay, the details of that aren't that important. The important bit is that two things. One, that it works, right? In the sense that 
we know that if we take learning to an infinite limit, make that approximation and come back down to an n player case, there are situations under which we have arrived at a Nash equilibrium. But of course, that's not very sufficient in the sense that obviously monotone reward functions and potential reward functions don't cover the entire spectrum of what's available. And so trying to understand when it's possible to learn on a mean field game, or in, in your words, when it's possible to actually make that, uh, use that trick, that's very much a, an area for open question. Now, as to why that might be useful, why that might be interesting is because instead of solving this offline problem, right, where you have, uh, you know, you have your dynamics set out in advance and then you uh, play, you, you make your entire control strategy before actually implementing it. When you apply learning, when you apply fictitious play, you get to make these decisions online. And what that means is you get to do things like adapt your behavior under varying circumstances. So for example, let's take you know, a flock of, uh, well, we could take birds, but let's just use aerial robots, right? Aerial robots are working under dynamic and uncertain conditions. And so to suggest that we can you know, just set out their strategy beforehand and just assume everything is gonna go according to plan, is obviously not the best strategy. Rather, we would like to be able to adapt our behavior online, right? And in fact, the authors of this, this first study kind of looked at a, a similar situation in which you have a swarm of your agents, again, completely monitored by this, this distribution, right? So uh, at the beginning, the, all of the agents are essentially packed into this top left-hand corner. Right? But what applying fictitious play in a mean field format allows you to do is adjust the distribution, adjust this distribution function over time. And what that means is the agents can actually follow this path all the way towards the center of the maze and you can actually control it. That's obviously a toy example, but the point of it is to show that when you apply learning on a mean field game, you're actually able to control a significant number of agents in a very tractable manner, which was not, which kind of goes contrary to what the earlier study was saying, which is that if you increase the number of players, then um, prediction and control become inherently difficult because of the chaotic dynamics. That's the advantage of learning uh, in a mean field game. Now that said, there are some open questions in this. There are lots of open questions in this, but I've only uh, listed a few of them. And the reason why there's a lot of them is because, well, this whole notion of the mean field game came about motivated by problems in uh, electrical engineering, in economics, that kind of thing, right? And in, whilst there was a lot of analysis that went into it, much of it was stopped short at the fact that, you know, it works once, you know, if you apply the appropriate regularity conditions, my whole mean field game format works. But that doesn't tell us a, a whole lot in terms of when it does work, when it doesn't work, conditions that we, we need to impose on it. And so there's lots of mathematical questions that need to be asked and answered about this whole field. I've listed a few of them here that I think are particularly interesting. The first of which is to actually continue this prospect of learning on mean field games. Fictitious play seems like a natural um, starting point just because it relies on the best response function or the optimal control, but there's no reason why we have to stop there. But what I actually thought was quite interesting, uh, and it's a, a point that's been raised by, so, Mean field games were pro proposed back in 2006, um, independently by two sets of authors. And both actually put forward this suggestion of, of future work regarding me mean field games when you have incomplete information. 
right? So in this format, instead of assuming we know what the entire distribution of the system is going to be, we actually impose some uncertainty on that, right? So we throw in some common noise. What that means for, let's say, you know, the bar problem, right? Is maybe I show up to the bar and I, it, it looks packed, but I can't actually see beyond the crowd of people that are immediately in front of me. It could be quite clear behind them, but it just seems to me as though it's a, it's a really crowded bar. And so this question of incomplete information really steps in to mean field games because we, you, we've so far assumed complete information on the part of the agent. And actually there's a lot of uh, more technical questions that need to be asked in, in that sense, because so far, like you said, we've made this assumption of when you solve the game in the infinite player limit, and then go back down, you get close to a Nash equilibrium, right? So that's in some sense saying that as you take the end player game, you work out the Nash equilibrium and then you take the limit to infinity. The limit of these Nash equilibria is the equilibria in the infinite player game, right? That actually doesn't turn out to be true when you impose um, partial information on, on the part of the agents. So when you have partial information, you're no longer looking at straight Nash equilibria, you're looking at what's called a Bayes Nash equilibria, right? You can throw the word Bayes around, you know you're talking about uncertainty. And in that context, in the context of the Bayes Nash equilibria, as you increase the number of players in the game, the whole problem actually, it doesn't always converge. So you don't always have this situation where the limit of the, Bayes Nash equilibria is an equilibrium in the infinite player case. So again, a lot of interesting questions to be asked there. And hopefully um, when we come back in October, we'll start to look a little bit more at these open questions and, and how to tackle them. But for the time being, that's everything from me. So thank you all for, for listening. I hope you all have incredible summers. And uh, yeah, thank you. Are there any questions? Yeah, thank you very much, Ahmed. It was a very nice uh, series. Uh, other questions? Yes. Yeah, all right. yeah. Can I, has anybody looked at reformulation of the whole thing? Like, uh, this could be like an agent can do random walk. And yeah. Once I think about random walks, I can think about some, like the whole problem could be like viewed as avoidance. I'm avoiding certain bars that are too dense, right? Mm -hmm. So this random walks <laughs> ideally will not cross too many times because that means that too many people end, the, end in dense bar. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or I can take another, another view. Instead of looking at n going to infinity, I can start with very toy problem of two bars and two players. Yeah. Okay, and if I don't want to see Mr. Smith in the bar, I want to be in the bar alone <laughs> in a funny way. Yeah. So, so once there are two people in the bar, or I know this bar is dense, so the notion of dense bar can change and in a nested way going back and forth so i wonder if we generally if reformulation of the problem can lead to new different approaches that are different from the mean field because the mean field as we have seen is involved with so many assumptions yeah, and and maybe 
different approach can lead to more definitive answers without the caveats? I mean, I hope so, because as, as you said, there are a lot of assumptions that are made along the way. One of the strongest ones is this notion of, you know, everything being completely uniform. And that's not always going to be the case, as, as you've said, right? Um, there have been attempts to reformulate the, the mean field game. To be honest, not many of them have been very successful. Um, the most successful one that we've seen so far is the one that I've just um, shown you guys. Um, but hopefully, you know, with time, we can start to assess things like, you know, variations within the population itself. Um, as you said, like varying notions of like the problem of density and also uh, problems of equilibria within the games itself. So to answer your question, yes, there have been attempts to reformulate it. None of them have been super successful so far. Okay. Actually, one of the other problems with the uh, mean field games, um, if, let me show you guys something, is that with, uh, with the mean field game, we had these, this coupled set of equations. Where was it? Here, right? So we had this McKean Vlasov part, which was um, actually, it's better if I go to this one. Yeah. So we had the HJB part, right? Which is, as I said, like a generalization of dynamic programming, right? Um, yeah. And then you have the second part, which is the actual dynamics of the agent, right? Which is this um, uh, SDE. The thing that's annoying about it is that they both work in opposite directions. So the HJB part is kind of looking backwards in time, trying to you know optimize uh, in a backwards manner, whereas the SDE part, the McKean Vlasov part, is looking forward in time, trying to move the dynamics forward. And that forward backward nature makes things quite difficult not only to analyze but also to program um, the I mean I've tried it, it it does make it quite hard to um, visualize and to get some analytic results going or some numerical results going as well um, so there's also been attempts to resolve this issue um, to reformulate the mean field uh, game so that this problem doesn't keep occurring uh, the, the ways that have been looked at is by looking at things like maximum principles, that kind of thing, but none of them have been successful. Um, so there are like fundamental limitations to this mean field format, both, as you said, in terms of the assumptions and in terms of the numerics. Hopefully, uh, in time, some of those will be resolved. Okay. There are some questions by Felix and uh, Juan Sotero. Felix, do you want to unmute yourself? Or? I mean, they are on the chat, Amir. Oh, they're on the chat. Um, except for infinite players, any idea about games with uncountable state spaces? On, on, but yes. So um, games with continuous state spaces. Um, or un so the, the biggest issue with the, these sorts of games is that Nash's theorem doesn't hold because Nash's theorem holds only, uh, so Nash's theorem about the existence of the Nash equilibria, it only holds when you have finite spaces, finite action spaces, finite players, that kind of thing, right? Um, so the problem of moving to continuous action spaces and that kind of thing becomes significantly more difficult. Um, and so in terms of the dynamics of games, the work on that is much more sparse. They, I, I do remember off the top of my head a few pieces of work that try to derive the dynamics uh, of things like Q learning or, or it's like reinforcement learning, that kind of thing in that context. And I can um, send those to Boom at the End to then forward to you if that's of interest to you. Um, then the other one, in practice, how do you define the weak interaction of agents? Okay, so in practice, the idea of weak interaction is simply just that any given agents, 
influence on the entire population is negligible, right? So in the bar problem, it's the idea that if I decide uh, that I'm going to go to bar B instead of bar A, it's not like 50 people are just going to follow me because I'm super important or something like that, right? Instead, if I go to bar B instead of bar A, everyone's going to continue doing their own thing independently of my own decision, right? Um, that's, the, that's the notion of weak interaction of, of particles, just that everyone's influence on the whole population is negligible. And that holds mostly when you increase the number of players, right? So if you have, let's say you have a, a million robots in, in, a, in an environment, right? Let's say they're all wheeled robots and one of them, one of them is faulty, right? Uh, maybe uh, one of them, yeah, just veers off and, and goes into a completely different direction. That might affect the local behavior of the entire swarm of robots, but it's not gonna have a big effect on the entire population of a I million, mean, I don't know how many robots I said, but on the entire population. That's the idea of, of weak interaction. Uh, if you could only prove existence, but not uniqueness. Okay, so that's actually a really good point because you're absolutely right. You can prove existence, but usually you can't prove uniqueness. Um, and okay, so there are certain conditions under which uniqueness holds, mostly under like monotonicity uh, conditions of, of things like the, the F function that I, I mentioned earlier. Um, but the thing is in most games, whether they're finite player games or infinite player games, the Nash equilibrium usually isn't unique, right? It's quite rare to find games that, unless you specifically design it that way, you're not always gonna have a game with a unique Nash equilibrium, right? And so you could, if, if you were designing it, you could obviously uh, ensure that your design um, allows for a unique equilibrium, but most of the time we just take it as a fact of life that you know which equilibrium you go to will depend on your initial conditions. Um, and honestly, we just accept the fact that uh, uniqueness isn't always gonna be guaranteed. All right, any other questions? Yes, one final yeah. question on my side. Yeah. Uh, can you control to which Nash equilibrium point you can go on the fly? Um, in finite player games, yes. Um, because essentially the certain conditions, for, for example, if you choose your initial conditions right, you immediately can uh, ensure that you go to a Nash equilibrium. But the when you're dealing with um, finite player games and you don't have control over the Nash equilibrium, what you are allowed to do is impose a control function that kind of works as an inverse, um, how do I put this? So it's, it's kind of like in reinforcement learning, for example, the equilibrium that you move to will depend on uh, the parameters of your agent. So things like uh, their temperature parameter, which is like a measure of their irrationality um, and their step size, right? So how, uh, how big of a step they're taking at, uh, at each iteration. So which equilibrium you converge to will depend on those two factors. And um, recently an important point of work actually has been looking at how you control those parameters online on the fly so that you move to the equilibria that you actually want to move to. Um, it's a difficult problem and there's only been like a few small solutions to it, but in theory, yes, it is possible. Again, I can send Bumadi and the references for that and we can forward them to you if, if that's something you're interested in. Okay, thanks. Yeah, all right. Yeah, or you can maybe like, uh, they can contact you directly by email. Or yeah, that's maybe, also yeah. an option. Yeah. Yeah, anyway, thanks, Emil, uh, very much for the nice uh, series and thanks all for... Uh... Oh, okay, yeah, there's another question, yeah. Oh. Um...
It is always feasible to provide numerical examples for any game or show it graphically. I'm sorry, I don't quite understand the question. Oh, oh, sorry, no, I do understand it. So um, you're, you're saying, is it always, okay, so realistically, no, it's not. Um, the reason why, so in, in the talks that uh, we've been doing so far, I focused on the ones that you can show graphically, right? Um, because we focused on things like, um, you know, two player, two action, three player, two action, that kind of thing, stuff that you can actually plot. Um, but most of the time, the state space that you're dealing with is really, really high dimensional, right? So when, if you have 10 agents, all of with a hundred actions available to them, you can't really plot what's, what's going on. Um, you can't pl plot their trajectories in, in state space or anything like that. So most of the time, no, it's not possible um, to show what's going on. Oh, sorry, did you mean generate a numerical example for a game that gives a behavior that you want? Ah, uh, okay, so in that case, yes. So that's a problem of what's called mechanism design, which is essentially this notion of, I want a particular behavior to occur. So this kind of plays back into um, the previous question of, can you uh, ensure that you can go to any given equilibrium? So mechanism design essentially says, I want a certain behavior to occur. And then you reverse engineer the game that produces that behavior. Um, and that's quite a small, like a, quite a young field. Um, but again, theoretically, it's possible to do it. It's just only possible to do it on very small games. So at the moment, it only really works on things like small, like five player type auctions, that kind of thing, but it hasn't quite yet abstracted to a much wider sense of applicability. Yeah, so it, it would only work for illustration. It would only work for like toy models um, at the moment, hopefully in time, uh, th that will become a little bit. That's all part of uh, a field called uh, algorithmic game theory, um, which, it, I mean, if you search the book, algorithmic game theory, it, it goes uh, into a lot more detail in terms of things like mechanism design and that kind of thing. Um, again, these only really work for, for toy models and not yet for full-scale games. All right, yeah, thank you. Uh, I guess no other questions. Okay, okay, thanks Emil again for this uh, nice uh, summary for the, doing this four series, I mean, the four lectures. And thanks uh, all for coming. And so we'll uh, hopefully, as I said, uh, resume in October, probably uh, towards the, yeah, third or fourth week of October, yeah. In the meanwhile, we can check the, the YouTube channel, yeah. Yeah, thank you everyone and take care, cool. yeah. Thank you everyone. Yeah, yeah, thanks, bye-bye.